to go at three feet of Pete. Our city planner, like Let's stand on Pete, or is that going to push in? Yeah, it's going to push in, so. So you're going to, I mean, based on what they saw, it's like hands on yeah. the planning. You know, if you go down two feet, it's clean okay. sand, the silty sand, and that's kind of what they're. And they did those on the shoulder. Did they run any through the pavement? Yeah, I did it through the pavement. Let me get great. myself ready. So we got great. Yeah. pavement sections. Oh, okay. That was part of the right. the goal was to see what kind of pavement. Okay, I can sound great. Yeah, yeah, you did it so long ago, I don't remember. So you got four then inches if you of fit, uh, one eight inches. Write right. something you can feel pretty good. Thanks for being durable. Okay. okay. Sounds great. So Thanks so much, Jake. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you can. Need, native stuff. <laughs> Two inches of fit. Right, I was going to say, I think the two inches probably the north. Or seven. Seven inches? Oh, depending on where they did it, because yeah. we've done some overlay stuff and did some extra. There's three yeah. and four. Or, <laughs> this is not good news, okay? <laughs> or on seven or eight. Yeah, it's tough. We've got the aquaculture pond and right. then the... Plain sand. Right, that's a big one. Yeah, they didn't well, see. the other one is the organic linen center. So we could do 18 inches right. over it. Well, that'll be back eventually. Yeah. Soon it'll um, be to hopefully resolve itself. But yeah, it's, there's a lot going on. You know, yeah. from uh, well, like, uh, five years ago. I started to come up here. Well, I kind of hoped that it was going to be like positive stuff going forward. You know, we were getting, you know, businesses we'd like to have here, and you know. Mm hmm. Yes, and that might be better. Yeah. Close to a culvert we had them do on some time. Just like the way they use this. When everyone kind of speaks of that. It's kind of a man dash. Yeah, I know. At this point, it's just uh, what I told them to do because they were haggling over it. Right. 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 Yeah. And then see what. So we'll have to. Uh, you ever heard of this guy? Have to design. Like Morgan? No. Design. Is he country? Why? <laughs> no, you look country. Do they have a cowboy hat on? <laughs> they don't do that anymore. Don't they? <laughs> besides, <laughs> he, besides Clint Black and <laughs> Garth Brooks, where's that? <laughs> they so a while back, weren't they? Or are you a country fan? <laughs>
I'd like to call to order the uh, September 25th, 2019 Columbus City Council meeting. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our first business tonight would be a motion to approve the consent agenda with additions. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. On to letter C. This will be a discussion and motion of 7162 and 722 167th Avenue variance IUP and excavation applications for an aquaculture fish pond for John Arndt with an enclosure. I think it looks like this. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, um, Mr. Arndt came before the Planning Commission six weeks ago um, with his application and came before, it came before the council a month ago. Um, the planning commission chairman gave a report to the council and the planning commission, after adopting the findings of fact, voted and their recommendation <clears throat> was to deny the application for both the variance and interim use permit with a five vote vote, again, denying it. We're here tonight. <clears throat> and our attorney has drafted a memo for you. It's in your agenda packet, quite a large packet of materials in, in your packet um, on this particular application. What we'll have uh, uh, our city attorney do, he'll go over the memo with the council and then we'll have a formal discussion and we can then go from there. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, given the history of the city's mineral extraction ordinance and excavation ordinance, which has had a couple of iterations over the last couple of years, uh, and the large amount of, large volume of materials that you had, uh, we want to try to summarize uh, how we got here and how the code applies to this project. Uh, the memo provides a little more detail, but I'll, I'll hit the salient points. Um, the current form of the ordinance dates back to about 2016 uh, when the city, uh, in response to concerns about loss of developable, developable upland, uh, the city council uh, directed staff to prepare an ordinance that uh, created a couple different classes of excavation types of uses. Uh, the first would be exempt class, which is minor excavating under 200 cubic yards. The second would be an administrative permit for excavation over 200 cubic yards. And the third would be uh, essentially what would be a commercial extraction activities, uh, any type of commercial uh, mining in the city. Now, uh, as you'll find out a little bit later tonight, sometimes defining commercial is difficult, uh, what constitutes commercial. And uh, that 2016 amendment uh, required that all mineral extraction, which is the commercial type classification, would require an interim use permit. Uh, a lot of, several standards were created at that time, uh, including a standard uh, requiring frontage uh, on minor arterials or collector roadways. Uh, and that was effectively put in place as a prerequisite for any interim use permit for commercial mining in the future. And that was due to uh, longstanding concerns from residents of Columbus who lived on rural residential roads uh, who had mining trucks going uh, back and forth in front of their properties. So language was added that required any IUP, uh, any applicant for an IUP to be on a minor arterial or collector. Following the adoption of that ordinance, uh, it became apparent that a loophole existed and there were 
uh, what were effectively commercial mining activities occurring under the guise of residential development, uh, which uh, was technically allowed at the time under the 2016 ordinance. So the council, in order to further limit that type of excavation, uh, clarified that residential excavating uh, could occur uh, and excavating could occur under an administrative permit issued by the city administrator when and where that excavation did not result in the loss of developable upland in the amount that exceeds uh, that necessary to handle on-site stormwater. Uh, so there was an acknowledgement that some amount of loss of upland is necessary to handle stormwater, particularly in larger developments, uh, but anything in excess of that would require an interim use permit and would be treated uh, as a commercial activity. So with respect to this project, uh, this falls into that, uh, essentially that fourth category, which is a residential, um, residential excavation activity uh, that exceeds, that results in more than an acre of uh, recreational ponding. It results in a loss of upland and it is in an amount that exceeds uh, that necessary to handle on-site stormwater. So all of that is to say that this permit should, rather than an administrative excavation permit, this is always going to be treated as an interim use permit uh, in the same category as commercial excavating. Uh, so the way that those applications work together, the applicant has applied for a variance to the prerequisite that is on a minor arterial. Uh, and because uh, the Planning Commission has recommended denial of that variance, uh, it can therefore not meet the requirements of the interim use permit, so they therefore also recommend denial of the interim use permit. And it may be helpful, uh, I apologize for talking uh, at length on that issue, but it may also be helpful to get some perspective from uh, the Public Works Superintendent on the history of those complaints. I know a lot of the correspondence is about uh, traffic related to those. So if you think that's helpful, I, I know he's prepared to address that. Thank you. So let's start with Jim. Jim, come on up, please. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, or good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, so in reference to complaints, um, over the years that we had um, hauling in the community. Um, we've dealt with many, many types of complaints as you know, Jessica and Elizabeth have all fielded probably many more than I have, but um, we would, pretty much every time there would be a hauling day, there would be hours of touchy-feely um, conversation with residents, whether I had to personally go out there or Jessica or Elizabeth or somebody in the office staff would um, field complaints for dust and, you know, trucks driving too fast, um, rough roads. Um, we've had in instances uh, vehicles that have drove off the road, um, did some sort of property damage, um, driving around other vehicles and, and things like that. So. Um, it, it, there was never a hauling day without a complaint. So, I mean, Jessica could probably add um, many, many more hours of talk and discussion than I can, but um, we pretty much went out every time. So I spent hours with, you know, different residents um, talking about, you know, yard damage and dust and, you know, whatever. I mean, it was, it was painful for sure. So, I, I mean, I don't know if you guys have any questions. I can, I can field some, but I mean, Jessica could probably add different complaints than what, what I personally dealt with, but um, I know that they got a lot more complaints than I did, so. I echo what you say, and I would say there ne was never a hauling day without multiple complaints. Right. So, I, I mean, I, I think the office staff felt the brunt of the complaints, and it was only when residents needed to see somebody or talk to somebody that I would I would personally get involved then. But, you know, I made, you know, they would call and I would go out and, you know, literally follow vehicles and see how fast they were driving and 
and you know talk to different residents about sweeping the asphalt after they drove on it and all sorts of different things so watering complaints so I mean it was it was it was extensive to say the least anyone have any questions for Jim thank you Jim Anyone have any questions or discussion between ourselves? Well, I actually, I'd like to just add a couple more things. I mean, there's a number of things that have been um, pointed out by staff and by the Planning Commission that are problematic with this application, and you summarize those nicely for us. But in addition to that, I'm 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 really bothered by the fact that the applicant has made um, applications to various agencies responsible for the water side of this stating that this is going to be an aquaculture pond and if you look at Minnesota statutes there's a definition for aquaculture it says and this is statute 17.47 subdivision 2 aquaculture means the culture of a private aquatic life for consumption or sale and private aquatic life means fish, shellfish, mollusks, crustaceans, turtles, or other animals, aquatic animals, cultured within an aquatic farm. Um, aquaculture is an agricultural pursuit. And so in the application uh, made to Rice Creek Watershed, and I'm quoting this, aren't construction company is proposing to build one fish pond to grow and market largemouth bass, sunfish, and yellow perch in the local area. A secondary purpose would be for recreational fishing for the landowner. He subsequently says in another area, the pond will be accessible to remove fish for marketing purposes from the driveway. So is, I, I'm curious why this isn't even being put forth for us as a home-based business because the agencies responsible for the water side of this are operating under the assumption that this is going to be an agricultural pursuit and a, and a fish farm. And we're being asked to look at it as recreational. And so I, I don't know how, how we could even move forward when there's such two such conflicting uses documented in applications. I also have a problem with the statements that have been made to the residents that were asked to sign uh, letters saying that the dewatering will not affect operations of any water wells. While we have an engineer here who says you can't really say that, and you've got the DNR saying that having a condition made in their permit saying that if there's any uh, effect at all that operations have to cease well if there was no possibility of that they wouldn't have that condition in their permit and we know from Thurnbeck farms when they did their dewatering it may not have affected wells but it affected other people's ponds because we happened to talk to some of those people while we were out campaigning and they were not happy that the fish in their ponds all died because their ponds all went dry and that was actually made clear by our engineer in his report too that this likely would affect the wetlands and the surrounding area. So in addition to you know, the, the, the performance standards in our own ordinances, we also have this conflict to deal with. Anyone else? Elizabeth, do you have anything to add? I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't have anything to add. Well, then would someone like a motion? Would someone make a motion to either accept or deny? We have a chance to speak to this. There's some misstatements. There's, there's some serious misstatements. Mr. Mayor, I, the, public, the public hearing has been closed, uh, and it is at the council's discretion whether or not to accept additional testimony. Uh, but it's uh, at this point the public hearing has been closed. Council, it's not additional testimony; it's clarification of the record. Mr. Mayor, if if you like to take additional clarification, uh, you're able to do so. Uh, you can certainly limit it. 
Yes, certainly. Who would like to speak? And we'll limit it to <coughs> Thank you for the opportunity. four minutes each. Thank you for consideration. Patrick J. Kelly, Kelly and Lemons, St. Paul, representing John Art. To my right is Wayne Johnson. First of all, just Wayne there, Jacobson. Wayne, Wayne Jacobson. Just quickly on that permit that uh, Council Person uh, Hagelin stated on the aquaculture. Um, I w I've been working on this project for two full years. We have gotten a permit from every natural resource agency. We have their approval. I um, think you meet an exception no, based on not, aquaculture. No, not an exception. I've talked to all the people personally. Also, John Arndt has never stated that he intends to grow fish for market. I this is when, this is right from the application you're that was submitted. Ma'am, don't do that. Okay. All right. So then getting back to the, the so the purpose of the project has always been to be a private fish pond, not to sell fish for market. That's never been a part of the application. And uh, I guess the last thing I want to add is that, um, you know, going through all those agencies' processes, we've had some very narrow things that we've had to meet in terms of water quality, in terms of how we did the project, and we met all those criteria. It's a recreational fish. That's what he's mm -hmm. representing to you. So I have, we have a copy of the application to Rice Creek, and I, I quoted exactly what was written in that application. So if, I'd, be, I'd love to hear you explain why it was written in that application if that's not what the intent was. It may have been written that way by a staff member, but that's not what we wrote in our application. And we got all the permits from Rice Creek Watershed District. Second issue dealing with dewatering, we worked closely with the DNR. They didn't have a problem with the permit. If there was a subsequent issue, challenge or taken care of by the DNR, <clears throat> engineering is just assuming or speculating whether or not yeah, there's a not. problem. The DNR also didn't have a problem with the Thurnbeck Preserve that dried up ponds a quarter mile away. Me, that doesn't have this. Each permit is unique in itself. You're correct. So, I'm just stating a concern that there could be an issue because their wetlands are connected right. to adjacent properties. And mm -hmm. I'm telling you, there's not a concern. You can okay. say that as a as a as a water resource based engineer. Based on our engineering and yep. the check and balances, if okay. there is, if there was, I, I couldn't problem, say that. So I'm. No, I'm just telling you, if there was a problem, it would stop. Okay. Thank, thank you for your consideration. Anyone else? All right. Would anyone like to make a motion? I will. So I move to adopt the findings and recommendations in the staff report and to direct the city attorney to draft a resolution to deny the variance request at 7162 and 7222 167th Avenue. Is there a second? I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And another motion, please. I'll do that one too. I move to adopt the finding and recommendations in the staff report and direct the city attorney to draft a resolution to deny the interim use permit request at 7162 and 7222 167th Avenue. Is there a second? Second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motions both carry. And now we'll move on to number eight, the Planning Commission report which is going to be a review of the uh, Planning Commission public hearing of the planned unit development ordinance. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and staff, support staff. <coughs> Excuse me. My name's Ron Hanegraaff. I'm on the Planning Commission. And on September 18, 2019, we met, and it was kind of a quiet night. 
only had four customers here. But uh, we discussed the uh, ordinance amending Chapter 7A of the City of Columbus Code on the plan unit development. And uh, after we discussed it, we voted unanimously in favor of re the new revision of it. So that was item number one that night. Item number two that night is Mr. Todd Carroll, unless anybody has any questions on that. Secondly, that night we had Mr. Todd Carroll from the Minnesota Department of Transportation uh, gave the commission a presentation regarding landscaping, fencing, monument signs, and branding for the new bridge on 35. His goal is to add interest to the bridge and making it appealing to the public. They plan a mixture of trees, evergreens, and shrubs, which is scheduled to start in the spring of 2021. So we as a city have time to put in our input, input regarding what gets developed out there as far as landscaping. He was a very interesting man, and I can't remember the, Ryan was the next guy? Uh, Ryan um, Cuttington also attended the meeting. Yeah, it was very uh, informative and stuff. The only thing I have a question for, uh, Elizabeth, is how come they call that 35 and 97? Shouldn't that be 35 and 23? You know, um, County Highway 23 stops at the bridge, and Trunk Highway 97 starts at the other side of the bridge and goes to 61. Oh, okay. So, I, thought, I thought that was a county deal, because Washington County is about a half a mile down the road. <coughs> yes. And my understanding is um, MnDOT has jurisdiction of Trunk County 97 from the bridge to 61. Correct. Okay, I cleared up that one. I have a question, Mr. Chair. When are they planning to do this, next year or the year after? The spring of 2021 is when they're gonna get the landscape put in, the spring of 2000. So not next year? but the next year. Right, and then they said that the contractor has like two years with all the trees and the watering and stuff like that, then I guess, I don't know who's, if it's DOT that takes care of that, or are we gonna take care of, no, DOT takes care of the landscape, you know, the, make sure the trees and all that get watered. So MnDOT has a budget, while a small budget, <laughs> um, they, have, they can do a certain amount of landscaping and then if we want beyond the landscaping um, then we would have to pay but we really didn't talk about other amenities um, we talked about looking at other interchanges to look to see what we what was liked and not liked um, I can tell you the first time I met with Todd Carroll he explained to me how the Forest Lake interchange had had um, fencing and landscaping and they took care of everything and I actually had to drive back up there and actually look for all of that, and they do. If you actually look, you know, they, they take care of it and maintain a certain portion of it, and the landscape theme kind of goes into the center of the boulevard, but I had to actually drive up and look at it, so I guess I was paying attention to the traffic light, <laughs> not the landscaping, but, um, and everyone has a little different flavor of what they want as far as landscaping and theme, and Shelly, I think you have your work cut out for you, so we can kind of get what we want to brand or think or what kind of things we want to do with the bridge. And I think also that, uh, you know, we had the apartments. We all went out and started looking at apartments. If you get time, go down to County Road E, cut up there and look at White Bear, the way they uh, manicured that intersection there. It's great landscaping. So it's, uh, I think it is, uh, it's our presentation. It's our to the public, this is us. So, I guess we got some time to discuss it, right, Shelley? I mean, Council Long. <laughs> very good. Is that it? Thank Unless you. Unless you have more. Thank you. Thank you. Do we need to make a motion to adopt this ordinance? So, this ordinance is in its draft and at this time, the, nor the regular procedure would have been that you would have called a public hearing because the Planning Commission now has adopted the draft. Um, I had to get a public hearing notice in if we were going to make it on time for October 2nd. 
So if you would call for the public hearing, knowing that it was it will be in the newspaper um, coming up, and we had to do that for timing purposes because we do have an application that requires this ordinance to be, and I won't say in place, but at least co um, concurrently. And I know there were some questions. So I'm going to have um, Jake just kind of briefly describe why we're doing this for plan unit development and, you know, why you can do a plan unit development in every district. That's an easy one, huh? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, this, I, I know that the council, along with the Planning Commission, have discussed several iterations, particularly design standards and, and whatnot for this district. This is an ordinance that specifically uh, and formally makes that PUD uh, an allowed use in all districts. Under the existing language, it's arguably uh, permitted, and it has consistently been approved via PUD. Uh, but as we were reviewing it, we thought we could firm up this language a little bit better and establish some additional standards uh, for all districts. This also eliminates the suburban residential PUD, which is no longer uh, in, no longer relevant, uh, creates some, like I said, some standards, uh, and then also uh, takes into consideration the future mixed-use residential commercial district, which is currently being drafted. Uh, by the city planner to accommodate future development up in the northeast quad. Uh, so this is really just setting the stage for the next step in the northeast quad. Thank you. Anyone have questions or discussion? Good. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. So would you please re-explain, Elizabeth? This goes in the paper. So this will be in the paper. Um, I think now what there, it was last Thursday or this Thursday, but um, we needed a 10-day notice before the October meeting. And so it's been published for a public hearing um, at the next Planning Commission meeting. If you decided that you weren't didn't want to call, we would just cancel the meeting, but at, at least this way, for timing purposes, I met the time constraints of the application. Um, in this particular case, um, this PUD would be applied for the Viking Industrial application that's coming before you. They have a few things that they wanted to vary, and staff thought it would be appropriate that that application um, take advantage of this plan unit development language in this ordinance. So Mr. Mayor, we just need a motion to approve setting the hearing for October 2nd for the PUD ordinance. Would someone make that motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. And now we're no, uh, still on number eight. No, I'm sorry. We're down to number nine, public open forum. Is there anyone here who would like to speak at a public open forum? All right, we're done with public open forum. Number 10. Uh, is Josh Pribble here tonight? Uh, moving right along, uh, letter D, uh, engineer report. Yes, good evening. The item on the agenda is uh, looking for a motion to approve pay request number two for the Ziegler water tank conversion. Um, the Ziegler water tank conversion and the SCADA system were done in two separate contracts. This is for the Ziegler tank and electrical modifications to finalize that. So it's about 40% of the, of the contract um, for this payment. So... Looking for a motion to approve it for um, $22,734.45. Would someone like to make that motion? So moved. Second. And seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes. I didn't have anything else formal on the agenda, but just um, a couple updates. Uh, as of today, we received 
approval for the city's local surface water management plan from Rice Creek and heard that on Monday, uh, Coons Creek had approved it. So I think we have the three watershed district approvals now <laughs> um, at long last. So the two um, projects that are under construction are uh, Hornsby Street and we're encountering some um, bad soils out there, no surprise, but uh, we had some boring showing peat and muck excavation might be six or seven feet deep. They, after 15 feet, they got through it along 97 in the swamp area. So there'll be some modifications to the design to uh, help shore that up to do the excavation. And even the first three or 400 feet of Hornsby Street, we had a, the road section we're proposing was uh, 18 inches of sand with uh, seven inches of gravel on top of that and five inches of pavement. We need to go a little bit deeper with the sand layer to get rid of the bad soils that are there to bridge that. Um, any of the extra work on Hornsby will be likely covered by LRIP funds, but any of the extra work on 97, there was a cap with a cooperative agreement, so some of those might turn into city costs. So we'll see what we can do on that. And then um, on the Southwest Area Utilities, that project is continuing yet with the lift station getting closer to completion. And I think they're doing some testing today on the um, sanitary sewer and force main pressure test. And um, there's been, you know, came back previously for some extra costs there. There's gonna be some more um, on some of the soil conditions that were out there and some, um, some items on the lift station. So just giving you a heads up, I'll be coming back to the next meeting, not the bearer of good news. All right, thank you. Uh, number 12, the attorney report. Mr. Mayor, uh, we are looking tonight for some direction on the no haul route ordinance. Uh, this is under section 6-100, uh, which establishes commercial vehicle restrictions for uh, certain identified roads in the city. Uh, that includes Howard Lake Drive, uh, portion of Howard Lake Drive, Zurich Street and Running Aces. Uh, and there's also the addition of Notre Dame and 181st. A concern came up about the definition of a commercial vehicle. Uh, when this ordinance originally came through, there was some attempt to peg uh, that definition to a certain weight limit. Uh, but there has been, that never made it through in the final draft of the ordinance. Uh, so there is some concern about what constitutes commercial vehicle. Uh, for example, a large pickup used for commercial purposes could be a commercial vehicle if you attach a trailer onto it. Uh, so what we're looking for tonight is just some direction. Uh, I don't think we need an answer. Um, if you do have some guidance, if there are thoughts about what you're trying to prevent or trying to avoid, uh, we can put that into the record and send that back to the Planning Commission. But ultimately, uh, we want a little bit of guidance on what, what the intent is. Uh, and then hopefully give that over to the Planning Commission to study it and come up with some language. All right. Well, I think the intent was to not destroy our roads any faster than necessary. You should, should put some kind of weight restriction or... <clears throat> I was thinking 26,001 26, pounds and higher GVW be restricted. That's a... You lower the weight less if you wanted, but that's... The Planning Commission has been looking at that before. Is that who came up with the ordinance? Is that someone they want? We, we, had, Several a, years? we had a vote on it before, uh, Jeff, and, and uh, didn't, didn't clarify what was stated. I know we had some different languages on some of the signs, and I'm not sure how this one came up. But. And there, there is, of course, the seasonal road restrictions. There's also other roads that are subject to weight restrictions. This is really intended to capture commercial vehicle, so really a type restriction. Uh, now I think the, the goal is ultimately to address a certain size of vehicle, uh, but there may be other concerns and ultimately that's just a policy decision for the council. Uh, so if, if you want to, uh, you know, for example, eliminate all trucks over 26,001 pounds, um, that's good, but there also may, may be other intents uh, and we, we didn't want to assume. Would it be uh, time well spent to have Planning Commission look at a couple other neighboring cities and see how they, what do they describe it with? 
weight or size or size and weight or I can't sit back any longer. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, what would you like to add? Um, I, I, I personally don't know that we need the planning commission to look at it. I, I think that if the staff looks at it in some fashion to try to come up with, see what other communities have done, but we do need a designation. Um, I had a resident ask me and I, I just said, I can't lie to you. I, I don't know what that means. So I, I mean, depending on who's pulling you over is what you're, is who's going to get a ticket. So um, there's, there's nothing that really specifies. It just says no trucks. So we need to come up with something and, you know, to try to make it black and white, not gray. So I think that if the staff looks at it, I can look at some other communities and, you know, Jake might have some input and, you know, maybe Dennis, but I, I think, uh, I think that's where we should start. But if you have any things that you want us to make sure that we avoid, because we don't want to, we've somewhat made a career out of this one, <laughs> and, and we've went around the block a couple of times, so I know that our intent is to get it right, and there is an intent. So if there's something that you want to try to avoid driving on that road, let us know, and then you know we'll work from there. But. My thought was 26,001 pounds as well, because that's that's pretty easy. But I don't know. I mean, that means a U-Haul truck can drive down there. Are we good with that? I, I mean, that's that's kind of what it comes down to is what what are we trying to stop? I think I know our initial intent was to keep heavy trucks off the road because we're bearing that cost of repair. Um, you know, using it as a as a haul route was. One of our initial thoughts was a haul route, and then we ended up with truck route. So, I mean, I think I know what our initial intent was, but we need to designate some way of making it easier to um, quantify it, qualify right. it. Well, so, I think the original language started off with five tons per axle or something I think like it was that, seven. or but, seven or whatever it was. It was, and then and that didn't work either. But there. But there's some hard parts of that too, because if you look at a vehicle, I don't know how to make seven tons per axle. I mean, you can't, it's not just a linear, I count the axles and divide the weight. It does, it's not really how that works. I mean, because the front axle weighs more than the back axle. And if the axles are too close together, then that is one axle. So, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to try to work that hard mm -hmm. at it either. So. I think most drivers know what their axle weight would be. Roughly. I think most drivers probably do, but the guy that's enforcing it may or may not. No, he wouldn't. So so, so therein lies the problem. I don't want somebody to get a ticket that shouldn't get a ticket, and I don't want I don't want our intent to be lost. So, I mean, that's, that's kind 26, of... 26,001 pounds. I don't think I've ever seen that sign anywhere. No, but that's that's your uh, commercial CDL. I know it is. You have to have CDL to that. I know it is, but that's I've never seen that sign anywhere. That's, he don't really want a sign. He wants... A law written don't you did you want to put it on a sign or yeah I don't I don't know if we would post weight maybe yeah. maybe we would post weight at that point I oh. I don't know I, I mean I, I think I think we need to look at that yeah. but there needs to be some designation come up with a couple options at least right you come back because I mean at 26,000 pounds anybody in this room can drive that vehicle if you get to 26,001 now you need a commercial driver's license so that's somewhat easy to say this is commercial this isn't but it could be a private guy are we trying to stop you know you driving i mean you got a you got a commercial driver's license and you know what what is our intent i see the signs you got up on howard lake there uh, you got a cup that it's basically, a truck with a cross through it yeah yeah it tells people what to do and what not to do you know i think it's pretty self-explanatory it, it, it is, yeah. but you need a rule behind it, though. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, oh. when somebody asks me what is my oh. what is the definition of no trucks, I, I have to be able to give them yeah. an answer. I can't. I don't know. It's not not good for me. I'd, I I'd like to work better than that. Well, yeah, then, I figure that the staff, you know, Jim and uh, Jim and the staff, could uh, come across something. Mm -hmm. He's more knowledgeable than most of us are. All right. Do that. Are we good with that? Do we need a motion to do that? It's. I think that's good enough. As long as you're, as long as you're comfortable with that direction, we can take that and uh, we'll work with Jim to identify some alternatives and bring it back to the council. Very good. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. 
Uh, number 13, a city council members report. Denny. Hey, uh, we had Falls Fest, like everybody knew this last weekend. I want to thank the three guys that helped me, Ray, uh, Lloyd Raybine, uh, Myron, and his son Chad helped me park the cars. They made me a lot of leg. We had 60 cars, two tractors, and a trailer with about 20 hit and miss motors on it. We had a good turnout. It was a good turnout. And everybody enjoyed it. And uh, this, <coughs> this is my last year. I have some people in mind to take it over for me. I talked to some people tonight, and they, they haven't said yes or no yet, but they're talking, thinking about it. That's all I have to be forward. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just would like to echo. I thought Fall Fest was was a great success. Um, it seemed like we had a really good turnout. We had some new uh, folks at, at doing displays. The Noka um, Conservation District and the um, Sunrise Watershed uh, sort of in combination were there, and they were really excited about the turnout and the conversations that they had with with uh, our residents and, and and especially with kids. So I think the petting zoo was a was a big success. We had lots of really nice comments on that. So it was it was a good day. Good. I had a couple of people talk to me in the past about uh, putting a sign up on Kettle River of uh, introducing Howard Lake ahead. I don't know if that's something we want to look at or not, but uh, people come into town go down Kettle River and don't know exactly where Howard Lake is and they're slowing down, they're going to turn here, they're going to turn there. So that's maybe something to look at. And also, we're replacing stop signs or stop ahead signs eventually. Yes. Uh, the one on Howard Lake is, is really bad and that's a visible sign for everybody. Maybe we want to replace that one also. And uh, Wendy Tester called me. She owns uh, or is going to own a farm behind that property, Haggard Farm. I know I talked to Jessica the other day and then she called me back again want to know what's going on with that and I know she said she did a title review and it's going to the attorney office I just wonder where we're at with that we should have the title review prepared by within the next week so we should be on an agenda at the next meeting oh no nope there's a we were going to have a neighbor a neighborhood meeting oh, okay um where we were going to talk to all the neighbors about you know process and I, there's five steps in the big picture, and I can't remember steps two and three or, or one and two are done. I think three, four, and five still have to be done. So I think there's a couple of different steps. And I know that, that um, you know, Jesse's been talking with Wendy Sorry. and indicating what the process is. All right. All right. So where are we at with the stop ahead, or uh, Howard Lake Drive ahead? Do you think we need that or talk to the county about getting that sign put in? Anybody? Have any ideas? Any options? Think it's yeah, needed? Commission it. I don't know if it's needed, I, but we can talk to the county if you feel it is. Um, I think it is too, and I, th I thought it before. It's a pretty popular road, and if you're not from the area, you don't know exactly where. Even if you're from the area, I got to slow down, look at the, make sure I'm turning the right place. So you'll talk to them then. Sure, we can please reach out. Thank you, Shelley. How did your, may I ask, how did your uh, branding meeting go? You had your first branding? Well, I don't know. We haven't really discussed that on council, have we? We talked about it at the EVA and we made a presentation there, but yeah, I don't think we really yeah. said anything at, you know, as the council. Um, the Economic Development Committee had decided there was going to be a, a, a subcommittee that was going to try and do some type of branding of Columbus. And that means trying to find out what the essence of it is. And so we decided to put together a, a committee. And we've got some really great people on the committee, including um, Jaquel Hyder from Anoka County, who is, is you know, instrumental in trying to get people interested in Anoka County um, and in the, the tech corridor. And so we're just in the beginning stages of it. We've had our first meeting, and we are going out now and collecting information from a lot of the citizens to find out, you know, what, what is that essence of Columbus, and then being able to put that into um, the areas that are being developed, you know, specifically the four corners, of nine, uh, 35 and 97, but, but really branding the entire city and saying what kind of entity are we. And the more we define that, the more we will be able to make good decisions in the future for Columbus. And how often do you meet and when do you anticipate? Well, being? we've been meeting uh, because of the availability of Jaquel. We, we've been meeting, we're going to be meeting every two weeks. 
and then we'll just go forward from that and decide, you know, where we want to where we want to branch out. Um, at this point, gathering the information from the people in Columbus and deciding kind of what that, bringing it down to that decision of what is the essence of what we want to project to the rest of the Twin Cities and Minnesota, whatever, um, that's going to take some time. Thank you. All right, the next uh, item will be the public works. You're covered? All right. Uh, Jessica, Public Information Coordinator's Report. No report tonight. City Administrator's Report. I have three things on the, the agenda for the City Administrator's <laughs> Report. First is the appointment of election judges for the 2019-2020 Commissioner District 6 Special Election and Presidential Nomination Primary Election. The, it will consist of um, actually three elections. There's the primary and the general. Normally, um, this community does not have a, a, an election on odd years. We only have elections on even years. But um, in this case, these are three new elections that we will be um, having to administer. And so it is required that you appoint election judges and also absentee ballot judges. Um, and those are people who, um, as ballots come across the counter because you can vote in person, um, that board actually performs either they accept or reject those ballots based on criteria. So that's a separate board from election judges. And in addition to that, um, you are also setting pay rates. So in the agenda or memo on page 11, um, for a head election judge, it's 1175. An assistant head judge, it's 1125. And election judges, 1075 and on the following page you do have a list of election judges that have been trained and are eligible to work for the 2019-2020 election and also a list of people who would serve on the ballot board. I'd like to make a motion to appoint the listed election judges and absentee ballot board judges for the 2019-20 election cycle at wages indicated in the memo dated 925-19. And is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. At, um, at our earlier meeting, um, we talked about the preliminary levy, and the preliminary levy is due at the end of September. So this is um, the last opportunity for the council to adopt a preliminary levy. We had a workshop earlier this evening where we talked about budget and different items on the budget. I ran some new summary sheets, which you have before you, and also I have a resolution um, approving the preliminary levy that, re that reflects the discussion we had earlier. And then in addition, there's also a sheet talking about um, truth and taxation. And when we adopt the preliminary levy, we also have to send in our selection for a date and time for the truth and taxation meeting because when the tax statements go out um, that information is on that statement the hearings are required between november 25th and december 30th they must be held after 6 p.m and you must give an opportunity for the public to speak on on the budget and or levy historically we've always had it on the council meeting night and we've allowed, we've done it first, so people are able to speak. And we've had a short budget presentation during that um, council meeting. So on your additions, I do have a motion to set the truth and taxation um, on December 11th at 7 p.m. And then also there's the preliminary levy resolution. And Jesse, I didn't hear the first number, so I don't know the. Yeah, this one would be 1926. So it will be resolution um, 1926. And this resolution will also be, it will cover both the HRA EDA levy and it will cover the levy for the city. So would someone like to make the motion? Resolution approving, I'd like to make a motion to uh, resolution number 1926 approving the 2019 preliminary tax levy and tax abatement for property taxes collected in 2020. We need to 
mention the amounts? Nope, you just, uh, it's in the resolution. And do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. And then the second motion would be setting the truth and taxation date for December 11th, 2019 at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. or 6 p.m.? Um, December 11th is uh, a normal council meeting. And as, lo as long as it's after 6 p.m., we can, it can be at the same time as your council meeting. Then I don't have to post, I don't have to publish it. I'd like to make a motion of truth and taxation meeting uh, December 11th, 7 p.m. Second. Second. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> motion carries. I have nothing further. I'd like to say one more thing. Uh, recycle day. You have a recycle oh. day Saturday? Mm-hmm. Okay. There's a recycle day uh, this Saturday. You can bring two items for free, and uh, there's a list of things on the website, I suppose, that uh, show what things cost, tires and things, if you bring them up. Paper shredding. Paper shredding also. From what time until? I know, this, this came to me that. It's 9 to 1. Mm -hmm. 9 to 1? 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And you have to bring a valid ID if you want to get the two free items recycled. Got it. Columbus ID. Or showing you the it has to show a Columbus address, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else from anyone? If not, we're on to announcements and reminders. City Council workshop. Oh, we already had that. Tonight. Planning Commission will be October 2nd, 7 p.m. On the calendar, your calendar of meetings are on the back. Would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Meetings adjourned. All right, good meeting. So, oh, man, home time to yeah, just started up. He's the one who asked you to pay for one. No, I said the guy yeah, said that's it. right. Yeah. Somebody yeah. fell down. Yeah. No, that's not what I said. He said that. I think so. I think they got knocked out.